um, we just want to say thank you very much to both of them for um, joining us today and they're going to talk to us about supercondylar um, fracture cases and the difficult different surgical techniques they use based on different injuries that children sustain um, and it, so it's aimed at surgeons but if you're if you've joined and you're not a surgeon then you're very welcome um, I'm sure there'll be something to take away from it anyway and we've got a further um, webinar on supercondylar fractures tomorrow which is aimed more at paediatricians and ED clinicians and nurses and AHPs so um, feel free to dial into that at um, lunch time tomorrow um, just if you need the link to that popping in the chat we can do that um, otherwise I'll um, pass over to Greg and Joe and um, if anybody has any questions as they go um, just let us know so um, we the way we decided that we were gonna start doing this is, rather than sort of a didactic teaching thing um, we decided that we would present a load of cases um, and pretty much pretend one of us was being examined um, and the other person was kind of the consultant in charge. Um, and they're kind of a mixture of um, cases that we've seen or done or been involved with. Um, so like Lisa said, if, give, give us questions as we go along. Um, Greg, do you want, shall I quiz you on the first one? Yeah, sure. Okay. Let, let's, let's alternate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. OK, so I hope you can all see this. This is a five year old little girl who fell from a swing and we're being presented with this in clinic. Yeah, Greg, what do you think? so I think. Um, obviously, you need to check everything else. This, this talk is going to be very focused on the surgical surgical technique of the fractured hand. But just a few comments about this supracondylar fracture. I think some people will consider treating this conservatively. But I think that's a danger because there's definitely rotation here and and it's an extension. So um, the danger is that it that it just displaces more if you just leave it in a cast. And so I think this is unstable and it probably needs to be treated surgically after you've examined the child, obviously, and excluded a neurovascular injury. OK, what do you think about the position in the cast? Do you think that's if you were going to treat yeah. it? Yeah, that's a good point. I think. If you are going to treat these conservatively, the, they talk about being able to treat the um, grade twos uh, conservatively, you need to put them into hyperflexion. So 90 degrees of flexion is not enough. And usually if you can't get it beyond 90 degrees of flexion with too, because there's too much swelling, it means it's, it probably needs to go to theatre. Um, if, if they really are a grade two um, and you can get them beyond 90 degrees of flexion, then that's fine. But if you can't, then it's telling you that it's unstable and it probably needs to be fixed. OK, great. So this is what did. So. Um, um, with a fracture like this, I think um, I think we'll and we'll keep saying the same thing again and again, probably it's really important that you. Gen obviously, general anaesthetic um, with an armed arm board um, and then the way I like to we both set up the C arm similarly. Um, from the top of the head of the table, so you can get a true AP and a lateral um, without having to rotate the, the forearm. Uh, you can see this this one is probably rotationally unstable. So every time you, if you do this with your forearm, it's going to um, rotate the fracture fragment. So if you just keep the, um, once you've reduced it with inline traction, and that should be for about five minutes, you can hyperflex it and keep it like that. And you can pull the C arm over for a lateral. Um, and the, in, in this example, cross KYs have been used. I think um, it's fine to use cross KYs, but just a couple of points. Um, the lateral wire should probably have started more distally um, so that it at least touches the capitellum. And you can see the KYs are uh, almost crossing at the fracture side, which is not really a good good thing. So they should be a little bit more proximal um, or distal when they cross over. Um, and in terms of the medial, the medial wire, um, after you've done the lateral wire, um, you should extend the arm out for the medial wire so that the ulnar nerve is out of the way. Um, I don't always do a small incision, but I know that according to the guidelines, you should be doing that and, and making sure that the medial, the, the ulnar nerve is out of the way on the medial side before you put the K wire in. 
Um, and then always check the, the APN lateral continuously so that you are not making multiple passes with the K-wire, but basically one, one pass. Um, and then at the end, I always check that the, the wires are tight. I can rotate them easily, then I know that it's not a good fixation and I'll probably, if it's unstable, I'll put a third wire across. But but um, yeah, I think the the position there is probably fine. You can see there's already callus forming there. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think Greg's point about the wires, if you're moving them, that is <clears> a real telltale sign. And you must tell the registrars that they've got a habit of going in and out, in and out. And um, if they put it too far through the cortex, bringing it back again, every time they're doing that, it's sort of destabilizing it. So you want to do it really carefully and like just not keep pulling it backwards and forwards and have a very low threshold for putting that third wire in. Yeah. Cool. Um, there we go. So that's how it finished up. Um, wires, I think me and Greg do slightly different things with wires, but I pull them out at four weeks um, in clinic. None of our patients go off to theatre. We've got a sedation protocol. If you've got a child who is completely beside themselves, it's usually the younger ones sort of with three lateral wires. Mm -hmm. Um, but otherwise, they all get pulled out in Fratch Clinic um, by our plaster techs, usually. Um, and depending on the age of the child, I will put them back in plaster maybe for two weeks if they're a bit chaotic or let them start moving. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I'm probably just a bit more um, gung ho about that. I, I normally take the cast off with the KYs at three or four weeks. And yeah, probably. That's probably very wise if if the parents are anxious to put another back slab on or something for a few more weeks. But generally, I don't do that, and and I haven't that I can remember in fifteen years had a refracture. But it's not impossible. Yeah. Just one other comment here: you can see how stiff this is when it comes out of the cast at six weeks. Unfortunately, this patient was lost to follow up. But I don't generally uh, refer these patients to physios. I think that they usually do their own physio and. If there's any residual stiffness, I don't think the physio can actually help to resolve that. Um, so I, I, I generally just warn the patients before the surgery that there may be some residual stiffness. And, and most of the time there isn't, but in the, in the odd case there can be, and you need to warn them about that. I completely agree, definitely. I mean, physio for a lot of trauma patients, I think is not particularly useful at all. You can give the parents exercises in clinic. Um, and if you've got a supercondyla that has slightly mal reduced, um, you kind of tell them straight away what to expect when they come out of plaster. So they're going to have a little bit of hyperextension, a bit of reduced flexion. But these kids all remodel um, and over a period of time, then no amount of physio is going to help with that. And if the parents expect that, then it's fine. OK, it's your turn. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I am. Um, Five-year-old girl fall from a height, so you can see this is a lateral X-ray of an immature skeleton, and there is an obvious Gartland three supercondylar fracture, which is displaced. Looks as though it's been um, probably an extension type fracture. Um, this obviously needs reducing. I would be worried about the neurovascular status of this child, and I'd want to cl closely document that in A&E and before any manipulation was done anywhere. Um, I would be taking the child to theatre rather than doing it in A&E, um, and I'd make them nil by mouth and get them to the theatre as soon as you can, not necessarily overnight, but ideally as soon as possible. Just a uh, comment, Joe. I think um, it's very common for junior staff to just write neurovascularly intact, and I think we should always remind our juniors not to do that and to try yeah. and write a little table or something uh, in my previous trust, they tried to get this onto the uh, onto the computer system, but I don't I don't think it ever happened. Just to write radial, medial, median, and ulnar nerve, and then motor and sensory function, very easy to do, and then it's much clearer um, when it comes to post op and and the ulnar nerve isn't working as to whether it was iatrogenic or not. Yeah, very definitely, and I think we've tried to um, implement a performer for that exact reason. Um, with so many proformers being used in A&E now, it's yeah. pretty difficult to use them. But yeah. Yeah, especially as a lot of us are auditing all these supercondylar fractures. And one of the things that you have to do with the audit is each individual nerve. So, yeah, I completely agree. 
Um, so, so yeah, take us to the theatre. Um, so you can see this child received probably my choice of treatment, so three lateral wires. And like Greg said earlier, set the kid up um, with an arm board. I do not use the image intensifier. And I think that's quite an important um, point to you put across because we really want the image intensifier swinging under for the laterals. Don't move the arm. Um, these are all rotationally unstable in some way. So you're much better to use the image intensifier. Um, my first wire always goes through the capitalum and you can easily find that. So it's right next to lateral to the electron. Um, and then you kind of can see where your humerus is and you line it up on the AP. You can extend it a little bit so you get your angle for the wire um, and then swing it around to the lateral and put it in on the lateral usually. Um, and then as soon as you've got one in, you can relax the flexion a little bit. And then I put in the other one, other one. And you want them divergent like this. I try and, and put at least one other through the capitalum, but in fracture like this, as long as you're getting a good bite of the fracture and you're not going through fracture site, that's fine. Um, unfortunately, you can see with this one that the wires did pull out a little bit. Uh, maybe there wasn't quite enough hold in the proximal cortex um, and it's rotated a bit, it's displaced a bit. Um, and that's a very good reason when you're kind of cutting your wires, because by both guidelines, these should all be two millimeter wires, even the smaller kids. Um, I think the only time I would use a 1.6 is maybe in a one, one year old, 18 month old, but they're pretty rare really. All others I'd use a two mile. Um, and bending them and cutting them is often tricky and don't, sort of try and use the 1.6 cutters that we're always given, get the proper cutters out, because by trying to cut these wires, that's how they get sort of displaced. And then you don't x-ray again, they turn up in fracture clinic a week later, um, and it looks like a disaster. That's a good idea to get your x-ray in the backside once you're about to wake the patient up. Yeah. yeah. And also just another thing, I think um, that top right x-ray there, um, of the lateral um, x-ray, it's just, if sometimes you, you shouldn't really accept that in theater, um, there's a rotational instability there and, and that's going to set you up for the translation that you can see in that bottom X-ray. I think because it's such a narrow area of contact, if there's any rotation, it's just going to destabilize it. And if you've got those three wires just on the one side, I think it's easier for it to translate in the way it has in that lower picture. So, um, for me, obviously, in retrospect, it's easy, but cross KYs would have prevented that in this case. But I think another way to prevent it would be to make sure that there's no rotation, like you can see on the right hand side there, presuming that that's what there was in theatre. Um, yeah. Just some points. I also wonder whether looking at that top right one, whether the wires aren't going through the capitalum. They look as though they're going posterior to it. Mm. So maybe bringing that the wire forward just yeah. answer a little bit and give you more purchase. Yeah. That's a good point. Always easier afterwards. It is, of course. Um, and there we go. Like I said they heal. With this one, I would very much tell the parents to look, expect to lose a little bit of flexion. Um, and then it comes back as the kid gets older. All right. Okay. Let me yeah. take this one. So this is a, a much younger child. Um, I think just always think about NAI in these younger patients. Uh, usually the mechanism is clear cut, but always just have it in the back of your mind. It is it's an unusual fracture for a, a non-accidental injury, but just, just think about it. And this is also a very unusual injury that it's very distal. Uh, this is the kind of injury that you'd see in a transphyseal fracture, in like a new, in a, like a, a birth injury type uh, fracture. So that's just a very unusual to see um, such a distal fracture in, in a patient who's three years old. So um, nonetheless, um, you need to do the same as you would with the other other patients. Um, I find sometimes these transphyseal fractures do well with an arthrogram. I think I think this patient had an arthrogram, but it's very it's a very good way to see where the joint is and where the fracture is. Uh, so that's another good trick to do. And again, inline traction is essential in these more distal ones because sometimes that's all you need to reduce it. So you'll do your inline traction 
and then you'll hyperflex it or first inline traction and then make sure it's reduced on the AP. So uh, correct the translation and then flex it up and hopefully that'll correct the, um, the sagittal plane. And once you've got your uh, um, correction, um, again, because this is so distal, I probably would go for cross KYs, but I don't think it, um, again, if, if you, if you're going to do the lateral wise, make sure that the, the 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 distal one is going through the capitellum and that you're not going into the fracture site, that you're proximal to the fracture fracture site. And I think when we were um sort of talking about this talk, um, Greg made a really good point about this traction that you have to put onto these. Um, the kids have to be relaxed. That you can't have the anaesthetist giving them sort of the minimum amount of pain relief. They've got to be. Really completely fast asleep relaxed and the traction you do has got to be a good five minutes of proper traction um yeah. it's, it's got to be looking after the head to make sure you're, you and the red star aren't pulling the kid off the bed um it's not a quick sort of 10 second pull yeah um, make sure make, make, make sure that the anesthetist is actually watching and not not checking the the machine or anything quick and also also, I like to look at the at the clock because you always think five minutes is over after about a minute. Definitely. What's the clock? Yeah. Um, okay. The other thing we could talk about with these is how to orthogram. Uh, a lot of people are really scared of doing orthograms um, in kids. The landmarks are really difficult to feel um, for the sort of typical adult version of putting the needle in the radiocapitella joint. Um, for these, I always do an orthogram. You can feel the olecranon. You can feel where the olecranon finishes. You don't need x-ray even hardly um, to know where your landmarks are. And I just put the needle right over the tip of the olecranon um, and that pretty much always goes in. Um, and the other good thing about doing an, an orthogram for these is you can get some of the blood out. Um, yeah. And that kind of helps with their movement and the reduction. All right. What what do you think about the wire placement for this, Greg? Yeah, I think um, as I said, I think I think the wires are starting too proximally. You can see there is um, a possibility that it's actually missing that we're going in at the fracture site. It's well reduced, so that's good. Um, but there's also um, these are smaller wires, so you were saying maybe use two millimeter wires, and also that one wire that's going in from the anterior part of the capitulum on the lateral view is going way out too long and too posterior. So you've got to watch out for the nerves when you do that. Uh, and you can see that one going up the posterior cortex is bending, which implies that maybe it's not really strong enough. So that those would be, be my yeah. factors here. Uh, yeah. The other thing, sorry, the other thing to mention is um, you can see that clip there. I presume that's a clip for a drape or something. Uh, it's really important to drape all the way up into the axilla so that if you do need to use a tourniquet, either you can apply it beforehand and keep it high, or you can put a sterile tourniquet on if you do need to open it. And again, we were discussing this earlier. We both try and avoid opening it at all costs. I know some surgeons are very, um, very keen to open these um, if they can't reduce them early on, but I, I tend to try and get, get a closed reduction. I think I think the risk of, of stiffness is lower when you do that, but I don't have any evidence to prove that. So that's yeah, what I would say. Definitely. So with your traction, that helps not to get proper traction. And if I really still can't do get it reduced, um, the only kind of opening I do, I do a little stab posteriorly and almost like kapanji it up and it lets you sweep away the tissues sort of yeah. anteriorly with your McDonald. Um, yeah. I honestly can't remember the last one I opened. Um, and I've only had to do that posterior sweep in one that was mm. a sort of really nasty um, open one. Yeah, but it, it is also interesting, though, you can speak to any surgeon, they'll they'll have a different approach. Like the ones I've opened have been from the front with an open fracture coming through the front. But some of my colleagues will go through the medial side for the nerve to protect the nerve, and then they'll do a lateral incision as well. So um, you can go medial, lateral, anterior or posterior. But I like your point about the posterior access because it's it's probably less um, traumatic to the to the elbow. Yeah, yeah. But I guess you kind of do whatever you're comfortable doing to get it reduced. But you've just got to make sure it stays reduced. Um, yeah. And I agree, they do get stiffer if you open them. Yeah. Okay. So what happened with him? 
So you can see he's done okay. He's got a really quite big spike laterally, which is a complication of those wires. Mm -hmm. But he's he's fine. He's fine. Yeah, and he's done well a year later. He um, did refracture though. Bit of a crazy. See occasionally. Yeah. Okay. Questions. One thing about these, with I'm looking at these wires because I think they were done quite a while ago. Um, I even for lateral condors or anything, I don't bury K wires. Um, the only wound infections I've ever seen from K wires have been in ones that have been tried to be buried and have irritated the skin so much, and then they've got infected. It's as long as you kind of protect the wires and um, deal with them properly. I think it's pretty rare to get wire infections in these. I've seen a couple get sort of um, granulomas, but yeah, I really wouldn't bury K wires. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. Okay, Joe, you know this patient. All right, so this is a little three-year-old who fell off a slide. Um, she came in neurovascularly intact, and you can see she has got, um, it's more of a distal humerus fracture than a supracondylar fracture. Um, and I think that's a really important point to distinguish, that these ones are really pretty tricky. These should always have some kind of fixation. Um, they displace very easily because they're more proximal. Um, and they rotate, and the kids just don't do quite as well as the more distal supracondylar ones. Um, so this this is what I did. It was kind of very late at night, and I did struggle with it. I ummed and ahed about putting tens nailing um, a couple of tens nails in it um, because it is really quite a proximal one. Um, but at the time, I got these two wires in um, and you can see going through the capitellum and then the more proximal one um, isn't quite going through the capitellum but it's going up the lateral column and I felt at the time that that was kind of stable and I've got a good reduction um, but however you can see it did displace um, the wires came out and I think at the time I remember I did struggle to cut these um, we did not have any two mil wire cutters, and um, I think they put that probably did maybe displace it at the time. Um, but it's opened up a little bit laterally, but she's she's done okay. Um, it's healed up, and alignment wise and function wise, she's fine. Um, I think to critique my wires, I think my wires are too parallel. Um, I'm not sure that's the best configuration, and. and um, I think I probably should have either added one immediately or got them to get the tens nailing set out um, and tens nailed that. And um, um, just a comment on the tens nailing. Um, it's interesting. I've heard colleagues talking about doing them anti grade. So from proximal coming down and then going down into each of okay. the columns, medial yeah. and lateral columns. Yeah. That's, I think that's more of a European technique, but that, yeah. that's an interesting one. And then yeah. my only other comment would be. To consider a medial wire yeah again very easy in retrospect but um yeah if it's unstable at all uh, um you should consider it yeah and i think again for these more proximal ones i should have done and i definitely will do next time um just because they do displace they are yeah. tricky ones really tricky ones yeah and they're not the sort of one for can sort of consultants listening that you should be leaving juniors to do themselves um, to be honest, most pretty much all supercondylars, they are a two man job. I wouldn't kind of try and do them on your own. Um, it's you just get a much, much better result if you've got two people there, one person holding, mm. um, one person wiring. Although I do remember seeing in my fellowship a couple of older surgeons doing them on their own. Yeah. Where they, they, they reduce them and wrap them up with uh, uh, like yes. elastoplast on the forearm and then they just use the CR. Yeah, and then yeah. they just move them around and fix them, but yeah. I don't think um, I don't think that's a very re reproducible technique these days. No, and I think just everyone is so um, critical, rightly so, of sort of results. Um, I think we should be aiming for not necessarily perfection, but we should be aiming for better. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there you go. Your yeah, go. so that. That's a proper supracondylar fracture. 
Um, so remember in orthopedics, you always just think about the soft tissues. You can see here that the distal, the proximal humeral fragment is about to go through the skin and it may very well have one of the nerves wrapped around it. So just make sure that if you can, you just do a proper neurological examination on this child and try and get it reduced as quickly as possible. I think a case like this should be done on the night if it's really badly displaced like this. If there's any neurology at all, the patient should go to theater straight away. And again, um, it's amazing. These ones that are really bad often have a lot of soft tissue damage. So with inline traction, you can usually reduce them quite easily. And um, you use, I'd use the same technique again, inline traction, five minutes, and then flex it up to get it um, properly reduced. And then I would personally, I do cross KYs for this fracture because I think it's going right through the teardrop. And so I know that um, it's going to be unstable. Um, so personally, that's what I would do. But I think lateral wires would be fine as well for, for this. But as long as you get them perfect, they're going to be properly divergent and just make sure that they are going right across the fracture and not into the fracture line. Yeah. I think the other point with these is um, we all talked, we talked about traction already. Um, the ones you have to be really careful about, the ones that you mustn't put traction on straight away. So the ones that have buff buffened through your brachialis, um, if you've got an open wound anteriorly like this one had, um, you need to make sure that you've kind of reduced that buttonholing. Because if you then um, mm. put traction on, it's going to be almost impossible then to reduce it. Yeah. And I think also um, in, in A&E, this, this patient should have a, a backslab and extension. I think flexing them up in A&E is not really necessary and it's really painful and yeah. sometimes can cause more soft tissue damage. Yeah, even yeah. leaving them in the um, ambulance splint, um, take it yeah. off, check all their nerves and everything. Yeah. But there is absolutely no point sort of putting this child through more stress of flexing yeah. it up and back slabbing them, all the sort yeah. of stuff they've got something on. Just just another crazy thought while, we, while I'm giving you crazy thoughts. Um, <laughs> I know I know some surgeons in, in South Africa where I'm from originally would um, treat this with inline traction. So they yeah. do vertical traction like that and yeah. um they're treated like that for like a week and then they probably just put it in a cast oh my gosh um, so that's again that's not the the standard of care that we expect in the uk because we have the facilities and the and the expertise to to fix it properly but that's one thing if you're in a very rural place and you don't have access to theaters that you can do to reduce it and to try and minimize the risk to the neurovascular structures yeah just to give you the whole picture. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's that's what I did. Yeah. Uh, and I think so I can be I can be critical because it wasn't me. Go on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's great. It, it was an excellent result. Everything looks perfect. But um, definitely, I would have made those wires more divergent. Yeah. Um, and so instead of like that, make them like that. And the distal one is nicely above the fracture, which is great, but I would have maybe tried to make the lateral one more vertical and yeah. maybe started it more lateral. Um, yeah, going up the lateral column. Yeah, true. But, yeah. but having said that, it's a perfect result and you couldn't have asked for better. So well done. Thank you. I think uh, my initial plan was to put three in, um, but he, he was a very, very tiny six-year-old and ah. this was stable. And mm. when, when I'm testing for stability, in theatre, I literally wobble that around, like sort of, um, to see just to check that it's not going to mm. displace. Because if it's going to displace, I want it to do it then and there, so I can sort it out. So I think I wobbled it around and was very surprised by the fact that it didn't budge. Yeah, uh, I think I think just as a teaching point, be careful for the juniors. Don't don't, don't think you can just wobble these around too 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 viciously. <laughs> <laughs> careful careful wobbling maybe. Yeah. Um, okay, I think that's all we need to say for that one. All right, yeah, this is your oh, point yeah, you yeah. wanted to make, yeah. Yeah, so this came to one of my colleagues, um, fracture clinics, um, like this, his two-year-old had fallen off the bed and the one of the registrars had said, oh, there's an unsplaced supercondylar fracture, um, put in a back slab, it will be fine. Um, and it came back at two and a half weeks. It came back, sorry, she came back at two and a half weeks. Um, and then it, 
the consultant had a kind of closer look at these and was a bit worried. Got another picture which showed that. Um, obviously a lateral condyle at two and a half weeks in a two-year-old. And at this point, it's a really tricky decision. It looks undisplaced, but really without arthrogramming it, thing, we don't really know. Um, so you have a really high index of suspicion. And if you've got that, you need to have a really close look at them. Um, and don't just presume that a supercondylar fracture is, is a supercondylar fracture unless you're 100% convinced. Don't be worried about taking plasters off and getting plasters off, um, getting x-rays out of plaster. Uh, so yeah. I did a flash clinic yesterday alongside Greg and the plaster tech came around and goes, oh, you and Greg always just write a great big list of instructions all over your plaster forms about when you're going to have x-rays and stuff. Why can't you just get the x-rays um, at a certain time? And like, well, it's so important in the kids um, because of their feces and everything. You don't get proper pictures um, unless they are out of plaster. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is quite a good sort of point. So we've now got to watch and wait and hope that this heals mm. um, and that it isn't completely dis that it doesn't displace. And I think we'll get away with it. I think this one is fine. Did you but, get more rotational views yesterday? Or was it, are these then? Uh, yeah, I got more yesterday, and it was okay. It hadn't okay, displaced good. further. It was all right. Yeah, that's the key with the lateral condyle fractures. You must get an internal and external rotation view. And often that shows it's more displaced than you think. Yeah. Unless but, you, uh, yeah, obviously the gold standard is the arthrogram. Yeah. Um, okay. One more. No questions? <laughs> We're so clear, Joe. It's amazing. I know. Gosh. <laughs> so I, I just put this um, x ray on here just to remind you that. Um, don't forget about the flexion type supercondylar fracture. These are much more difficult to treat. And it's very easy when you're trying to reduce these to completely displace them. And then it's really difficult to get them back. So if you just gently extend the arm very carefully, x-raying it all the time as you're extending it progressively, when you get to full extension, generally they reduce um, unless they're obviously offended. But normally in extension is how they reduce and then you just get the alignment make sure a good a good thing to do when you examine these patients is always to look at the carrying angle on the other side so when you correcting the coronal plane you can try and um get this the same carrying angle as the other side so that's a good trick and then once you've reduced it you just you would just ky this either with two lateral kys or cross kys as per per normal normal but um when you see these, just make sure that there's someone with experience around because if these go badly in theatre, it, it'll end very badly. So that, that would be my point on this x-ray, Joe. Yeah, and I think that's similar to what we're saying with the proximal ones. There's no <clears throat> really for um, conservative management of these. They displace, they don't do well then, they're difficult. Um, mm -hmm. But in the same way that I don't really think there's much of a place for an MUA of a supercondylar fracture without wiring, unless, I don't yeah. know, very, very few cases. If I'm going to theatre with a supercondylar fracture, I wire it. Um, but I, it's so so much less stressful knowing that it's kind of in place and it's going to be fine, whereas watching it every week for the next month, yeah. Mm. I, yeah. I don't That's think right. I have a plan. Yeah. 